Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by KSU fan Drew Galloway, as always, and back getting ready to start a mostly normal week. That means Drew is back from uh, having the time of his life during the bye week, a.k.a. getting married. Fan, just living life, doing what he does, uh, and me still really pissed off about the Royals uh, on sa- on Ooh. Saturday night and also yeah. – uh, with everything that's taken place in college football this weekend, like many of you listening, and I think like the other two here, uh, that loss against BYU, again, while I think easy to write off and explain what happened there, it's gotten even more painful the further away you've gotten from it, not because of anything that BYU has done or K-State, but just merely looking around and seeing the carnage and chaos that has gone on in the Big 12 and everywhere else in college football that's led to Iowa State being the number 11 team in the country. K-State very well. If they had won that game at BYU, we're talking about them being well inside the top 10 right now. Uh, and that's also a win that they seem to really need at this point because their schedule has gotten a lot tougher from where we envisioned it being at the start of the season as opposed to others in the Big 12 where their schedule has maybe taken a little bit more of a dip and made things a bit easier. So we'll talk K-State Colorado tonight. Uh, but I really want to start there because this is something that D.Y. and I have talked about uh, throughout the week and you guys and, and many others have noted this. But if we were talking at the beginning of the season, I think even a couple weeks into the season, we noted about uh, in our Big 12 power rankings that K-State at one point, I think, was probably playing like four of the five bottom teams in our power rankings on their schedule. Things have drastically changed, though, where – we're looking at right now. And one of those teams will be Colorado who K state is going to see this weekend. But if you think back to the start of the season in big 12 play, the thought process was BYU is going to be one of probably the three worst teams in the league. Um, Certainly through the, through six weeks, that's proven to not be the case. BYU's five and O and two and O in big 12 play. Now Colorado has some juice to it. Uh, West Virginia, also one of the unbeaten Big 12 play teams. And then Arizona State and Cincinnati have gotten a little bit trickier. Now, the the concessions that can be made here, Oklahoma State and KU, obviously far easier games than originally imagined. But the difference there being those were two home games in which you felt like K-State was probably going to have the edge anyways. Very similar to the Arizona situation, where I think a lot of people probably would have said, K-State went on the road to play Arizona in week three. Um, that may be a game that they don't win because ever, there's a lot more comparable between those two teams. I, I think when you're playing at home against teams that are around your level, the expectation is you'll win most of the time. Chris Kleiman has done that for the most part. So I think when you look at that versus, I mean, you can go out and find anybody, but take Iowa State, for example, and look at their schedule. They've already played Houston and Baylor, gotten wins there. Um They play UCF at home, Texas Tech at home, Cincinnati at home, K-State at home, and then their road trips are West Virginia, KU, and Utah. Um, You look at their schedule, it gets a little bit tougher to see. And look, they're they're not even one of those that I would say is in the boat of having the schedule get crazy easier for them. Like some of those teams are just bad to begin with. I mean, some of the there are other teams out there that have TCU on their schedule, uh, which is certainly looking like a fun one. Uh, for anybody not named TCU. What do you guys make of the way that the Big 12 is set up and and what challenges are presented now for K-State or other teams throughout the league based on uh, what we've seen through six weeks of the season? Um, I think you n- you nailed it in the, the dynamics of the league changing from what was expected to what it has become as we near the midway point of the schedule. I, mean, I think there's a lot at play too. Is these usually you get to league play and you know each other because you've played each other for years. And this year, that is not a factor in the Big 12 nearly as much because you have so many new teams and you have so many new teams playing each other, playing old teams, et cetera. So I think we're seeing that play out a little bit as well as that, that familiarity that you usually have when you get into league play is not as nearly as big a factor as. as in the past when we've, you know, the league seemed to hold together for so many years. So uh, that's a dynamic. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and, and I think every league's going to see this. SEC is going to see this. Big Ten's going to see this with 
the the nature of no divisions and so many teams and unbalanced schedules, somebody's going to get the luck of the draw and and take advantage of it. And I think we're seeing right now Iowa State and BYU are in that boat and could play that out for the rest of the season, if we're honest, looking at their schedules. So it will be see interesting to see where uh, it shakes out. I think K State is not in terrible shape, but again, as you as you said and as you you and DY have talked about, it's not nearly as favorable as we once thought it would be. No, the, the schedule is not as favorable, favorable as you thought because going into the year you thought, okay, the schedule shakes out to where you thought K-State could make uh, a big run because when you have your tougher games at home, you feel better. Now you kind of think that all of the tougher games are on the road. Like you could make an argument that, this, that the three toughest games this year for K-State are all on the road now. Uh, but the other thing I think that is kind of at play here is the league as a whole, I don't think is as strong as we kind of thought it would be. And, and I think that part of that is KU getting off to one and five start, Oklahoma State kind of being a disaster, even though they have three wins. But I think that when you kind of take into consideration Oklahoma State and KU really struggling, I think that that kind of takes a hit on the rest of the league because you look at Arizona State and Cincinnati, where Cincinnati is sitting at three and two, Arizona State sitting at four and four and one, and I'm not really sure if either of those teams are any good. And I think that that's kind of the the issue right now is that that the probably the six through probably twelve in the Big Twelve is just such a jumble of teams that I'm not really sure if any of them are actually good but somebody's going to walk away and like be in that sixth place because somebody has to. And, and even Iowa State and BYU, we talk about how their schedules really line up for them, but, but you look at them and they have their flaws as well. And, and like, I'm not, I don't think that either of them will be able to even go eight and one in the league. I think that they'll probably trip up twice. So I, I think that we're just in a weird spot in the league where, it's kind of just this transitional time where Oklahoma State not being as good and KU not being as good has really thrown the league into kind of chaos because you have teams like Colorado, Arizona State, Cincinnati, who we weren't sure about coming into the season that are now near the top of the league. And even West Virginia, who, again, <laughs> it, it seems weird that they could be 3-0 and in the Big 12 because I, I think that they could easily win this week. And, and I still and I still don't know if they're any good. Yeah, that that's that's part of this too. Is that you look at teams and it's like, okay, I mean, here here's the Big Twelve standings right now. Texas Tech is the only three and O team in the Big Twelve. They have played all these games. I'm not buying into Texas Tech yet. I mean, it's just a, last week I was talking. Uh, somebody was made some comment. One of the national writers. I'm like, okay, is the only thing you've watched Texas Tech do? is their win column because they've not looked overly impressive in their games. They look like they had some holes. Honestly, their most impressive game was probably this past weekend uh, against Arizona that they were able to go out and get the win. A couple of things that you you talked about there, Drew, that, that I, I liked and I want to point out here. Number one, I would compare the, the scheduling thing, but this kind of goes to what both you and Fam were saying. The scheduling situation, look at Iowa State in basketball this past year. Nobody would doubt that Iowa State was a good, a very good basketball team this past season. But what we were able to point out pretty early on in the process was, man, how nice is it that they don't have to play at Houston? How nice is it that they don't have to play at KU? And some of the other little things that happened in their – they didn't have to play at BYU. Like, they got a lot of games at home, and then your double-ups, that's so important. And – we're going to be having the same conversation about K-State in basketball season this year. And and this is why when we get into talking more about basketball down the road, if the talent comes together like I think it will, K this team for K-State basketball this year should legitimately be competing going in the last two weeks of the season for a Big 12 title, I think. Because I think they have the talent, whatever. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. What this conference realignment has done, and I think, you know, what got lost in all this, everybody was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have these awesome games. Ohio State and Oregon's a conference game now. That's going to be awesome to see. Texas and Alabama's a conference game now. That is so sweet. But 
when you have, like you were saying, 16 teams in a league, sometimes more or trending that way, you're going to have years where you don't have those awesome games and you have a, a pretty large stretch of this game sucks, this game sucks, this game sucks, and it's going to be random. And it's just luck of the draw and how it's going to happen to where there will be years where every conference is going to experience this. Your best team may not even play for your conference championship or they will just barely sneak in from some tiebreaker because they're going to have to go through a stretch where, you know, I, the Big Ten probably isn't a good example this year because I don't think that they have the top end talent yeah. to do it. But the SEC is probably the best example right now. Is it, that it could happen at Georgia this year? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So, like, that's one of those where they're just going to beat up, and you can't have one of those. Like Tennessee losing at Arkansas probably just took themselves out of this thing. I don't know what the rest of their schedule looks like, but it's one of those things where you, you see that and you go, okay, whatever. So you're going to get those high-end games at a greater scale than you've had them before. It's going to feel awesome. But everything else, and more times than not, I think this is a bad thing in terms of how you're determining all this. The other thing that I would kind of put into this is talking about another thing Drew mentioned, which is, you know, we, we thought initially a lot of K-State's toughest games were coming at home this year. That's why we like the setup for K-State. We're like, oh, you get Oklahoma State at home, you get KU at home, you get all these. Before the season started, one of the things that I did uh, on KSO was I ranked the games on K-State's schedule in 2024. And I ranked them on three factors, toughness, fun, and importance. So we can take the fun part out of it because, you know, whatever. Um, that, that doesn't really bear into this. The game that I said was the toughest for K-State this year was Oklahoma State. That is clearly not K-State's toughest game anymore. The game that I had number two on there was Kansas. That is not the case. The game that I had three on there was Arizona. That is not the case. And then you get to Iowa State, which I had at four. Colorado, I had at five, which is actually bearing out right now. Colorado might be higher on that list. But then you look at others. I had BYU at nine. Uh, Cincinnati was at 11. Arizona State was at 10. Those have all risen up the ranks. They've changed where they sit now in all of this. Um, and that's just kind of, again, painting the picture of where K-State's setup has kind of gone and, and why, um, again, you have to be a good team and you have to go out and take care of your own business. Like nobody's saying that this should be handed to K-State or other teams. But you look around and some people are going to get that help. And sometimes you have to get lucky. And K-State's in a position right now where they're not going to be able to, to just bank on getting lucky. They have to be better and actually go out and just take care of their business. Uh, and that starts this weekend against Colorado. Like This is the, the perfect situation uh, to kind of highlight K-State's spot that they're in. If they lose to Colorado this weekend, um, I, I don't think that they should be considered for the Big 12 title game. Could they win the rest of their games and be in there? Yes, but if they lose to Colorado, it – probably tells us that no they're not going to go unbeaten because this team just can't handle playing on the road against a team that has any form of a pulse right now so that'll be interesting to see how that uh kind of uh kind of unfolds um i'll throw up the big 12 standings here and then i'll let drew go uh what was your biggest takeaway from the big 12 this weekend i think that it's just that oklahoma state is a disaster they they have no way to win a game because you can't rely on alan bowman to throw the ball they can't run the ball with Ollie Gordon and they can't defend like this is the Oklahoma state team that I think that we all thought was coming last year, but last year they overachieved and this year regression has just hit them like a truck. And so I, I think that that's kind of the, that has to be the biggest takeaway I think is that Oklahoma state might struggle to make a bowl. Yeah, no doubt about it. Real quick. I'll throw this in here. Cause we, we just were talking about, um, how the schedule variety can kind of open up for you. Last year, Oklahoma State schedule, they got K-State, KU, Oklahoma at home. Uh, their road games ended up being Iowa State, West Virginia, uh, let's see, UCF, Houston. That's what they got on the road. Obviously, they lost the Iowa State and UCF games, uh, but they got to win at Houston. They got to win at West Virginia and – the schedule worked out in their favor last year. They only played two ranked teams the entirety of their uh, regular season, teams that were ranked at the time. That was KU and uh, Oklahoma, actually. 
And so they were they were kind of that first example of the team that got the schedule breaks and it worked out for them last season. And uh, that, I, I, I agree with you, Drew. All right, Fan, uh, your takeaways from the Big 12 through six weeks of the season. Yeah, it was um, – you, you mentioned that uh, the league is probably not as good as – it was in the preseason and the, the, you know, the metrics kind of bear that out. The average uh, in the metrics, if you looked at average, a bunch of across six or seven that I like to look at, there were 10 teams in the top 40 and five teams in the top 25 on average in the metrics. And right now there's only seven in the top 40 and three in the top 25 on average in the metrics. So you've definitely seen a drop. There's still, six and six outside the top 50. So it's really just been a migration toward the middle of as far as being ranked in the forties, tons of teams being ranked in the forties um, than, than were expected. Um, as far as this past weekend, it really was um, the only team that won that kind of was supposed to win was Iowa state. You know, you had all these kind of mini upsets Maybe West Virginia over Oklahoma State wasn't an upset just because it was in Morgantown, but the margin was an upset. Um, KU was on the road, but I think you still expected them to beat Arizona State. I definitely did not expect Texas Tech to beat Arizona. And then the Houston TCU thing on Friday night was just wacky. So I think we're seeing every week there's going to be two or three games that go not how you expect. Um at least for right now, until these teams kind of shake themselves out. And right now they they haven't done it yet. And I think we're still going to see more of that the next three or four weeks yeah. as we get down the stretch. It's just been a crazy league and um, not many expected results that you would look at going on paper into, into the weekends. Yeah, it makes it tough to project, and that that's why K-State's uh, upcoming situation with Colorado is so hairy now because yeah. it it's a lot more fun when you're – going into a road game and you can say, okay, we kind of know what K-State has coming here. You know, if they were going on the road to KU in 2015, you kind of knew what you are getting. That was a crappy team. You're fine with that. Um, it's like going on the road to, I don't know who else I want to throw under the bus here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's it's like going on the road when I was in high school and it's like, oh, you've got El Dorado or Winfield this weekend. Okay, congratulations. Uh, the Crusaders are winning by 50. Uh, it it makes it a lot easier. The road situation adds more variety to what could already have some variety yeah. if you're playing uh, a good team or, or whoever it may be. Uh, you mentioned Iowa it's State. It's like saying the oh, only right. place that's really easy to play at in the SEC is Vanderbilt. I mean, it's <laughs> exactly. obvious. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, Wait. and people would have thought that. But now <laughs> watch out when you go to Vandy. Yeah, Mason, you pointed out uh, that – Colorado situation being hairy. I mean, I, I said that I think that West Virginia probably beats Iowa State this week. That that could be three and zero in the league, West Virginia, yeah, next boy. week. And and Ren Baker will be sitting there like, I'm going to have to keep him again. I don't want to <laughs> keep him here. He's clearly not going to do anything for us. But uh, yeah, that's going to be fascinating to to kind of see unfold. Uh, Iowa State was mentioned, so good time to let everybody know that there's no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland, because the Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. And whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. All right. Uh, earlier in the summer, we drafted Big 12 teams and kind of playing a game where we're keeping stock in them and seeing how everything plays out. Uh, I've had that tracked now the last couple of weeks, and uh, I finally put it together with a clean graphic other than just me explaining words to everybody. So here is an update with how our, our squads are looking currently. D.Y., he's felt the wrath of the Big 12 unlike anybody else uh, with his, <laughs> his four teams. He's got 13 points in the rear. Uh, fan kind of stalled out this week mainly because of TCU and UCF with bad weekends, and then Utah and Cincinnati didn't play. 
and then Drew has been smoking everybody uh, with his crew because K-State, Iowa State, and Arizona State, mainly Arizona State and Iowa State being the two biggest surprises there. And then my team, slow start, but Texas Tech and West Virginia have rebounded, and BYU is my powerhouse right now. So Drew leads the way with 24 points. I have 21 in second. Fan has 18 in third, and D.Y., Probably should just cancel the season already and, and start thinking about basketball season. He should join all the KU fans and shift his focus there because he's not coming back from his current start, especially because now you're really just banking on Colorado taking taking the reins here and trying to lead your team, and that's a, that's an iffy proposition. Uh, any takeaways from how those have those teams have shaped up at this point? I think that you might be in the best shape to take it uh, just with Texas Tech, West Virginia, BYU, and even Arizona. Like all four of your teams can win every week. And, and I think that that's a step above everybody else. Like I, I don't know if yeah. I get another point from Baylor. <laughs> I was going to say Baylor may not give you another point. <laughs> it, it is crazy to think how much different it is than what we thought when we picked these teams and, how things have changed. Um, it just speaks to what we've, the conversation we've been having this whole time is this league is not what we expected it to be. And, and we're seeing surprises, both good and bad. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, we'll keep that uh, going and uh, check back in with it next week. All right, let's move on now. Let's talk K State, Colorado, as the Wildcats get ready to hit the road for the second time in Big 12 play. This will be the first of back-to-back -back weeks where they are on the road in the Big 12. What do we make of K-State getting ready for their second Big 12 road game and also their second coming at 9, well, past 9 o'clock Central Time? So there will be a lot of time sitting and waiting in a hotel room before you go and play in the mountains this weekend. Drew, I'll uh, let you have the first crack at K-State reuniting with Colorado. Uh, first off, extremely fun that this game is back. I am a sucker for the old Big 8, Big 12 games. So to have this be a conference game again feels really fun. Uh, I know that Mason and I uh, always joke in the hotel rooms about like the FSN Big 12 with Noxie running out with Ralphie. <laughs> And, and like I have so many good memories of K-State playing Colorado. So having that back just in general for me is super fun. Uh, but to be honest, I don't really know what to expect. Uh, I I don't know what Colorado is because I, I think that they've improved, and especially defensively this year. But when you see who they've beat, I, I don't get like overly impressed and, and especially not overly impressed with how they have won some of these games. And then K-State has kind of been a mixed bag on the road. One really bad game and then two really bad quarters at Tulane. So you kind of don't really know what to expect going into it. But I think that that's kind of like the fun of this game is that you really get to see what K-State and Colorado are both probably made of this week. Uh, but there is a part of me that is kind of wondering, is Colorado four and one and good, or are they four and one because they they beat North Dakota State, Colorado State, UCF, and Baylor? Yeah, I I think Colorado is an interesting team because they're probably not. <laughs> That's a great picture right there. <laughs> they're probably not what we thought they were. Um, and that is, I thought they would, if they were going to be good, they would have a dynamic high octane offense and a decent defense and their defense is actually better than their offense in most of the, the national, the metrics that I look at. So, um, it's interesting that they're kind of being defensive led, um, their running game is awful and really their run defense is not very good either. Their run defense is, is not good, which, which I like for K state in this game. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a matter of, of K state stopping big plays in the passing game. And that concerns me a little bit because I do think Colorado has that ability. Um, but, uh, and then you have the nighttime, you have the, the crowd. I don't think it'll be quite like Provo, but I think Boulder will be pretty amped and, 
it's a, really another test for a young quarterback and a younger offense on can you handle it? Are you going to be able to handle it and not make those same mistakes that you made last time? Because if you do and you lose the turnover battle and you lose special teams, it makes it really tough to win win games on the road, and that's going to be kind of the key uh, as I see it. Well, and that that's kind of the thing with – the BYU game, the Colorado game, West Virginia next week, and then the, the Iowa State one's a little bit different. But these first handful of road games that we're talking about maybe being a little bit scary, they're scary from the standpoint of, yes, there's a little bit of unknown, more so with Colorado on, is this for real? But it really comes down to K-State, if they just take care of their business and they're clean and they're smart, they should win these games. They should have beaten BYU if they did that. They should beat Colorado if they do that because they are a better put together team than both of those when they're playing at their peak. But it's very clear and obvious that through two road games this season, K State does not play at their peak on the road. How much of that is because you've got a, a true sophomore quarterback in Avery Johnson that has not had not made a road start until this season? how much of that is to be put on the coaching staff and not handling road games and, and anybody else on this team as well not handling it. That's where the this big unknown comes from. But the thing on Colorado, and this is similar to Texas Tech, is it's nice if you just look at the results. And this is what's kind of this is what's kind of interesting about how people t- talk about certain teams because I think there's been a lot of writing K-State off and and telling them to screw off because they got beat 38 to 9 by BYU on the road at 9.30 Central Time. There hasn't been a lot of people that have been dinging a 4-1 and one Colorado team for needing a Hail Mary to force overtime to beat Baylor, who is clearly one of the bottom feeders in this league mm-hmm. right now. And then, yeah, congratulations. You went on the road and you beat UCF, who they flat suck right now. K.J. Jefferson isn't the guy. Gus Malzahn is going to make an appearance on Fraud Watch in a little bit. Like it, it, It's just weird how we decide because it's all about expectation. K-State's expectations were higher. They had the bigger letdown game, and you can look past close wins as opposed to whatever else. And so I think that's the thing where we don't really know what Colorado is yet this early into the season. This is, I mean, in some ways, very similar to last season for Colorado, where if you look at them after five games – you're thinking to yourself, okay, what do we have here? Because they were three and two. They did have the blowout loss to Oregon, but they came back the next week and they only lost to a top 10 USC team at the time by seven points. They played them really tight. They won the next week against Arizona State, but then they lost six straight games to close things out. So it's early in the season where you don't really know what's coming about and, and what it's going to look like. And that makes this a little bit scary. But again, this is to me just about K-State having to go out there and look clean, do their thing. And another situation where if you just strike early, I think you're going to be able to to put this thing away and handle it. But I'm just not confident that they can do that right now. Yeah, It's, it's a game too, where I think that if K-State runs the ball and doesn't turn the ball over, I mean, it, it's a simple game. Do those two things, and I think K-State wins. Yeah, I I tend to agree with that. K-State should be able to run the football. Um, it's just a matter of can you get enough from the passing game, which I think is, you know, we saw the passing game do some good things against Oklahoma State. Um, the other thing I like is Oklahoma State is a heavy man team. I think Colorado is a heavy man team as well. And K-State was able to exploit some things in the passing game. Um, beating man coverage with different round co- route combinations and picks and rubs and stuff like that. And uh, I'm sure a lot of those will be queued up against Colorado as well if we see a lot of that same man-to-man coverage. Um, so that's a factor, um, you know, and then how much is K-State going to run Avery Johnson? Because um, I, I do think Colorado struggles with that. Um, and we saw not a ton of quarterback run against Oklahoma State, but against BYU when things got hairy, that's when K-State went to quarterback run like crazy. So I don't know if that's going to be a a thing that the staff does or not, but uh, those are things that I think, as Drew said, handling the game and not making those mistakes and and doing 
and playing football the way K State needs to will help dictate that kind of play calling as well. Yeah, uh, in in two of the uh, games this season that Colorado has played, so they're four and one, and two of their five games, the opposing quarterback has been the leading rusher for their team. Cam Miller of North Dakota State ran for 81 yards on 16 carries and two touchdowns, and Sawyer Robertson went for nine carries and 82 yards and a touchdown against them. And that doesn't even include the fact that K.J. Jefferson ran for 76 yards and a touchdown uh, against them uh, a couple weeks ago down in Orlando. R.J. Harvey had one more yard to lead the team in (laughs) rushing that game. So they have been exploited by it because the other two games they were playing quarterbacks that don't really run the ball and Rayola and then uh, whatever that bum that throws the ball for Colorado State <laughs> his name is so um, I hope he's getting I hope he's getting paid a pretty penny to not be very good um, so uh, this is going to be uh, a great a great test for K-State and this is a big stretch for them because you got to win these two games in my opinion to be really back into that Arlington race where we think that they should be and where I think overall the talent level is on this team. I mean, we'll, we'll have big 12 rankings come out this week with the, the chaos that has come about in college football in the big 12 this weekend. Now we're really going to have to start just going through and deciding, okay, how do I evaluate who's actually good here? Like Iowa state and BYU are still kind of getting the bump of, Hey, you haven't lost the game yet with how everything else has played out in the big 12, you deserve that credit to, to get those top spots. Everything else though, it's like, how do you decide if Baylor is better than KU or, or where does Oklahoma state go? Where should UCF be? Where should all these teams fall? Um, it, I think at the end of the day, if you ask somebody who is the, the best team in the big 12 as currently constructed right now, I think a lot of people would say K state because I think they are more complete and whole and I think that answer shifts to Utah if Cam Rising ever decides to play football again. So that's going to be kind of interesting to see how it all ends up working out. Uh, any other thoughts on K-State Colorado other than both of you apparently, are you confident in saying K-State wins the game in Boulder this weekend? I don't know if I'd say fully confident, but I, I think that this is a game that K-State should win because I think that they are a lot more complete than Colorado probably is. Yeah, I'd I'd agree. I think K-State's the better team as far as roster construction, have the better offensive line. I think we have the better defensive front. Um, We don't have maybe the star power of a Travis Hunter or Shadir Sanders, but the collection of the parts, I think, at K-State are better than the collection of the parts in Boulder, and I, I still think that's an extremely flawed team in in many, many ways. Um, but you never know on the road, and you never know um, really right now as you look at this league what can happen every, any Saturday. So still got to go play the game, and K-State's got to prove they're not going to have a repeat that what they had in Provo. I think really that's, to me, can you prove that that was a fluke, or is that going to be something that, that carries over to all road games this season? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it would be everybody in Big 12 basketball has a tough time winning on the road, but I would say even more to the extent of of K-State this season in basketball, where it was like at home, they were about like any other Big 12 team, but they weren't able to sneak enough road wins. And they certainly couldn't do it against anybody that finished in what, like the top 10 uh, mm-hmm. of the league. So that hurt them. And, and, and K-State football could be in the same spot where overall they're a very good team, but They have some kind of mental blockage that leads them to not getting it done on the road because, to me, that's what winning on the road is mostly about. It's about being able to fight through the change in routine and having to sit around in a different spot after the travel in a hotel room for however long, waiting. And then when you go out there, you don't get the boost and the juice from being in a locker room that you're accustomed to and having 50,000 people cheering for you you're in a situation then where it's probably a tighter, more uncomfortable locker room and it's 50,000 people booing you. And so you don't get that real boost of energy. I, I think it's it's a mental thing. Obviously, K-State basketball didn't have it this past year. And uh, K-State football has to prove that they have it now uh, this weekend against Colorado. Any concerns about K-State's secondary handling Shadur Sanders and then obviously the weapons that he has in the passing game because – 
I think there are probably a lot of people right now thinking uh, there may be a lot of 40 plus passing yard plays that uh, Colorado is able to rack up because K State's looked pretty weak in that area this season. Yeah, I think you'd be silly to not be concerned by that. Uh, just with how the secondary has played at times this season. Uh, but I, I think that at the same time as well, that uh, k State staff is so secondary heavy that I think that they will figure something out. I mean, we were talking about how we thought that there was a potential that Arizona could do the same thing that Tulane did. And k State really, for the most part, took away the big play against Arizona. So can they do that uh, against Colorado is the big question. And, and how much did they get done during the bye to fix whatever the problem is? But I, I think that there is some level of concern, but also I, I think that you'd also kind of be a little bit silly to not think that k can get it corrected because they've already done it one game. Now it's can you do it consistently? Yeah, we, I, I think – Secondary wise, we saw, we've seen a lot of the mistakes have been communication or being in the wrong place type mistakes. I think we saw that against Tulane. We saw it with the again getting beat by a trick play against uh, Oklahoma State. So um, those are things that you can definitely fix, but it's a it's a matter of of the players making sure they they lock down, focus in on the scheme and, and what their job is on each particular coverage that's that's installed. So um, hopefully that extra time will help with that. Uh, you know, I, I, I just had to have a hard time putting Kleiman and his staff against Dion and his staff and thinking Dion and his staff are going to get the better of Chris Kleiman um, and, and what – what K State's coaching staff has proven in their careers here. So um, I, I have confidence in that. And I have confidence, I think, like Drew said, is that you have a lot of guys that are, have been good secondary coaches and good at constructing secondaries on this staff. And I think we should see improvement in that secondary and, and reduction of those mistakes as the season goes along and not, not a continuation or, or even more as the season goes along, in my opinion. Yeah, it, uh, it'll be interesting to to see how it all ends up unfolding for, for K-State. I think it's a matter of can K-State win this game? Yes. Should they win this game? Yes. Will they win this game? You you can't confidently say that right now with this team. And they have to be able to prove that you can then say it next week when we're talking about them going to Morgantown. Because if they beat Colorado, you think, okay, I, I feel a little bit better about saying they're going to go and, and get it done against the Mountaineers. So we'll see uh, how it ends up working out. Any other final thoughts on the buffs uh, that you want to let Dan Hawkins know about here? (laughs) Uh, I think that a lot of people think that receiver wise, it is just Travis Hunter, but they, they have some really fast receivers as well. So I think that that's something to kind of be concerned about. Uh, I think that horn was, or Horn is really, really good and kind of underrated in how Colorado uses him. So, I I mean, I'd be a little bit concerned in the secondary, but I I think that if you stop the, if you make them one dimensional and make them have to throw it, I think that that really kind of changes the game. Yeah. It'll be interesting uh, to see and, and figure out this is K state. Probably they're, all things considered, their biggest test of the season right now to to prove themselves, at least. I don't know if it's their toughest game of the year to this point, um, but it certainly is in terms of what it could mean moving forward and how we evaluate it. So that is uh, what we'll do for now on K-State Colorado. We can move on and we can finish things off with everybody's favorite segment. It's time for Fraud Watch, everybody. So uh, <laughs> strap in. It's been a busy week trying to construct and figure out what exactly is going to go on uh, with the fraud watch this week. Uh, Drew, you were not here last week, so let me show you what you missed. This was the week five fraud watch. ton of guys just camping out in no man's land. Um, 
which, you know, it can be a good or a bad place to be. As we've established, doesn't mean you're good, doesn't mean you're bad, just means I don't have a good spot to put you because you're not a stud and you don't deserve to be on a watch advisory or a warning. So get those seared in your brain right now. Hey, just, uh, just because I wasn't here doesn't mean I didn't watch. Okay. All right. Well, lo- loyal listener. So uh, first time caller, long time listener, Drew Galloway. Uh, we have both Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham. If they didn't find a real quarterback, okay, real quick, breaking news. We got to see if Cooper BB says Kansas State in his Sunday night football intro. Uh, see if people are pissed. Wow, he said it, guys. All right, well, everybody breathe easy tonight. Uh, Cooper BB doesn't hate K State, if you can believe that or not. So, no worries there. Uh, on how that plays out. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be any drama on the message boards. Uh, but yeah, so we got all that. There you go. Uh, shout out to Deion Sanders again for moving up. He's getting, he's gaining ground. There was a lot of movement this week, despite some teams not playing. I didn't think I was going to move them around, but then I said, you know what? Let's, let's, let's shake this puppy up a little bit. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Here is week six. Look at all that. Look at all those guys moving off of no man's <laughs> land. A wild showing. Kenny Dillingham, we said it last week, he gets the permanent bump the rest of the season if he's able to beat KU. He did it. Way to go, Kenny. Dilly dilly to you. Uh, he's locked in there until next season. Uh, well, now, I will I will probably just throw him off the list if he wins in Manhattan, so think, think and be careful about that, Kenny. Matt Campbell, I didn't want to do it, but here the guy is sitting at, at whatever, 4-0, and 5-0. Um, he, I probably need to give him his flowers for – for being a stud again this year. I really want to be able to move him back to no man's land, though. So, uh, Neil Brown, this is a legacy game this week, Neil. You win that, you're back up to watch. Matt Campbell's back to no man's land. That would be fun. Joining Matt Campbell in the stud category, Chris Kleiman, Mike Gundy, Kyle Whittingham. Don't get too excited, though, if you are Kyle Whittingham or Mike Gundy, because Kyle Whittingham, if you don't get a real quarterback, just retire now. Don't even go to the end of the season. Uh, figure something out. Tell Cam Rising to, I, I don't know, shoot himself up with something, what, whatever they do now to get guys ready to play, because your team is atrocious. If you don't have Cam Rising, you're a fraud. Uh, Brent Brennan, come on, dude. Home game, Texas Tech, a team that really isn't that great. And Noah Fafita still threw for over 300 yards, and you muster less than 24 points. Just a, a a bad showing for Arizona. Just as I was starting to try and give them credit again, bad uh, job for Brent Brennan. Joey McGuire, watch category. That's pretty good for Joey. Uh, you know, considering where he was uh, at the start of this season and everything, he's trying to work his way forward and all this. And Gus Malzahn is hanging on to his watch spot by a thread. Things are not looking good for Gus Malzahn. The Gus bus has run out of gas. Uh, as they would say in the bench warmers. Uh, and then Mike Gundy, if he doesn't get a real quarterback, or really, this could be changed if Mike Gundy just doesn't have the stones to bench a 30 year old, 24th year <laughs> college student uh, in Alan Bowman. I mean, like, at some point, just cut your losses and realize that Alan Bowman has never been a great college quarterback and he never will be. Although, if Alan Bowman had stayed at Michigan, he'd probably be the starter there right about now. So, a real Sophie's choice there for uh, quarterbacking. And then Neil Brown advisory again, Neil, you beat Iowa state this weekend. Look at what I did for Kenny Dillingham. That could be you probably won't go up that high, but <laughs> you could at least go to no man's land. Uh, and then coach prime. I, I don't want him to get any higher than that. So that's a challenge to Chris Kleiman. Uh, if, if Chris Kleiman can win this weekend, he will go into the first ever super stud category on fraud watch i'm making a lot of promises to guys right here but that's what you got to do when you're trying to deliver uh dave aranda he's terrible he's about to get his own category uh thanks for nothing in Ames this weekend loser sonny dykes might get an even worse category than dave aranda and i didn't know that was possible but how do you lose to houston at home i mean they were they decided to start their backup quarterback and then donovan smith goes back in the game terrible situation there uh, and this is a re- we'll get back to that last spot on there. I know everybody's really excited about that one uh, because I haven't said Lance Leipold's name yet. If anybody's keeping track at home, uh, <laughs> what is worse, Sonny Dykes, or I guess more shocking, 
Sonny Dykes taking that TCU roster to a national championship game or Gary Patterson having that roster and getting fired with it. You know, the godfather of TCU football gets fired. That roster then goes to a national championship game a year later, and then they, they're they back to being dog crap. So uh, which one do you guys vote there? More impressive, Gary P or Sonny D? Uh, I'll say Sonny D because – uh, he wasn't going to start uh, Max Duggan to start the season. Yes. Great point. Yeah, that yeah. man loved Chandler Morris like a son. <laughs> I would concur with that assessment a lot because that Max Duggan was not going to be their quarterback. I would, uh, I would point out that Colorado started these dominoes here. It all ties back to Colorado. If they had yep. not injured Chandler Morris, we're not talking about TCU. But Sonny Dykes would already be fired. Yeah, that's true. Sunny D Live. Uh, listen wherever you get the Horn Frog Sports Network. So uh, that's what they call their coaches show. I'm not just trying to be like, aha, Sunny D, funny, great beverage. No, Sunny D Live is the name of their coaches show. Probably not as much juice in it uh, anymore. And then the last spot on Fraud Watch as we get back to it, Lance Leipold when he doesn't take accountability for himself. Uh, look, the Jayhawks have lost five straight. They have all been games that they probably should have won against teams that really probably aren't that great. And every time he gets in there and this, you know, his fan base, I think is starting to wise up on it a little bit and being like, okay, this is on you. If you lose five games in similar fashion, at least on the scoreboard in a row, but each week you can't say, well, I can't put it on the offense this week. I can't put it on the defense. I can't put it on this. At some point, don't you think you kind of got to, turn the finger around and point it at yourself and say, us oh, probably on the head coach. If this is what this team looks like right now, uh, Lance Leipold has to get it figured out. He deserves all the credit in the world for what he did to build the staff and, and get KU to the point where they're at right now. But we're kind of looking at a Sonny Dykes situation right here mm -hmm. where what he was able to achieve at KU to get to this peak a lot of guys that committed to less miles or guys that transferred in with him from Buffalo where he had Andy Kotelnicki who came with him. Well, he's now losing the, the less miles guys. He's losing his Buffalo transfers. He's lost Andy Kotelnicki. And as these things start kind of ripping at the seams, it's getting looser and looser and, and the wheels are trying to, to kind of fall off here. I, this is going to be a fascinating watch over the next year and a half to see how KU football tries to pick up the pieces from what's gone on with this one and five start. Because, I mean, there's a real scenario where the best that Lance Leipold can do has passed them by because the recruiting under Lance Leipold has not produced anything yet. Like, serious contributors on this team are not guys that Lance Leipold has brought in yet. And you think, okay, well, that takes time to do, like think of all that, but look at what Chris Kleiman has been able to, to kind of do instantly and get guys immediately coming in, making an impact, or other guys throughout the Big 12 have been able to kind of come through and do that and you know turn things around a little bit quicker um, in terms of getting their recent recruits on the field and contributing. That's KU's missing that right now. They, they're going to have to show next year, really, that guys that they've brought in organically – are going to be able to get it done for them. So that is a fraud watch for week six. A lot of movement, a lot of guys in places that they probably don't like. Kalani Sataki is getting close to being a stud because, as people know, I have a soft spot for him. I do like him despite the fact that I sometimes doubt him because he's an over-aggressive SOB. But they get Arizona and Oklahoma State at home back-to-back -back weeks now. Um, if they are able to take care of business there, uh, they certainly deserve that spot, and uh, the, they're in a, they're, they've got an, a big stretch coming up. They're going to be a real player, I think, for uh, the Big 12 title race. So, all right, any reactions to Fraud Watch Week 6? Uh, I know that you don't like him, but I would have Neil Brown at least in watch at the mm -hmm. moment. You know, I think I'd move Gus. I think I'd swap Gus and Neil Brown. Yeah, I, I'm probably giving Gus too much of a leash right now. He should be. He should probably bump down one. Neil Brown's got to win this weekend. <laughs> Legacy game for Neil Brown. I mean, what has Neil Brown done this year, Drew? Tell me that. 
<laughs> he he hasn't done anything. I just said that I don't think that West Virginia is that great, but I think they're going to start three and zero, and I think that's at least something. Do you want to know the combined record of the teams that uh, <laughs> West Virginia has beaten this year? Oh, it's bad. Uh, it would be six and eleven, uh, and two of those wins are coming from Albany, who's an FCS school. Um, and Albany, their wins this season are against Long Island and Cornell. So congratulations uh, on a, a big win there. A fan, uh, I know that you're a kind-hearted man. Uh, how do you feel about Fraud Watch this week? I, I think it's pretty accurate, I would say. Um, you know, I, I think Joey McGuire is probably right in the watch spot, but 5-1, and 3-0 oh is, you know, Texas Tech. You, see, you read on Twitter, Texas Tech fans are thinking they're Arlington bound, I think. So um, I think he's probably done a decent job there. Um, I think everybody else, Sonny Dykes, man. I mean, <laughs> that's TC. I mean, to, to go that south that fast is is pretty rough. Um, pretty and, and, and his post-game press conference against Houston was brutal. Like he was he was a beat down man. So bad bad post game press conference week for Sonny Dykes and Lance Leipold uh, yeah. two guys that don't inspire much confidence moving forward and thank goodness Chris Kleiman was able to uh, have his defensive line stand up in overtime in Arlington two years ago because yeah. that would be an ultimate gut punch if we're sitting here right now thinking how did K State lose a Big 12 title game to that guy um, Maybe that should have been the first indicator that a team that you know is twelve and zero and all that had all that volatility in that season, but whatever. Uh, so we'll see how it looks after this upcoming weekend, uh, because this is what the Week Seven slate in the Big Twelve looks like. Utah on a Friday night goes to Arizona State. That's going to be a really fascinating game to see how it plays out. This is kind of Arizona State's real proving chance to say, "Hey, we're we're a team that could legitimately win eight games." This season, if they're able to take care of business at home against a Utah team that I'm sure Cam Rising will act like he's going to play, uh, and then it'll be uh, Zach Wilson's little brother. So uh, the opportunity will be there. Game that nobody will care about Cincinnati at UCF. You guys both suck, don't care. Arizona at BYU, another really fascinating game. Arizona needs it to get back on track. This is an afternoon kick on Saturday, it'll be two o'clock local time there in Provo. It's a game they could get, but this is also one for BYU that if they win this, like I just mentioned, they make themselves a real player moving forward. And then Iowa State at West Virginia will be probably behind K-State Colorado the most interesting game of the weekend because both of those teams are unbeaten in Big 12 play, uh, and whoever the winner is certainly starts to, to plan their trip to Arlington a little bit more, and then K-State, Colorado. So, uh, Fan, what are your thoughts of the upcoming weekend in the Big 12? Just five games, uh, another light weekend before things really kick into high gear. Yeah, I would look at those. Um, I, I do think B BYU is bound to lose a game probably going into the weekend. You would not think they should. I think this could be one of those because I do think Arizona has enough talent in parts to, to – come in there and if they don't make mistakes exploit BYU and and get some big plays in the passing game with the quarterback wide receiver combination they have um you know two weeks ago UCF was kind of riding high and ranked in the the top 30 in the metrics and everybody thought maybe they were going to be that surprise team and they've fallen off Cincinnati's probably a little bit the other direction. They're probably a little better than we thought they were. They're still not good, but they're better because, you know, you had Satterfield is a much higher on your fraud in the fraud rankings than we would have put him at the beginning of the season because he was kind of a meh. Higher. Well, th th that's the thing. He he just can't go anywhere because he's, yeah. you know, what he's boring. You know, what are you going to do? But, but I, And I do think that Iowa State West Virginia game will be very telling for both those teams on who is – who is going to, I mean, I, I think a loss for either one isn't, isn't a killer, but it will say a lot more about the winner and, and what, how they position themselves in this race. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a good weekend to kind of play out everything else. Final thing we'll do here tonight uh, to kind of make this a, a nice tidy conversation on the big 12 and K state and, and where everything is shaping up. 
We're going to do a a segment called Race to Arlington, and we'll make this a weekly thing now because of how chaotic the Big 12 seems to be. So where you're going to give everybody, you get three picks here, and it's going to be like in horse racing. you got to give me your win, place, and show. So as of week six, who do you think wins the Big 12 title game? Who do you think is the runner-up, and who do you think – ends up right there in the mix, but uh, just barely misses the trip. So basically, this is you giving uh, your top three teams in order of not how they're playing right now, but overall how you project them finishing uh, and where you kind of value them to be at this current point in time. Um, I will, let's see, I'll, I'll kick it off here because I think it's uh, I think it's up to me to do this since I'm putting you guys on the spot with it. As much as I don't want to do this because I, I, I'm i not totally confident in them, but again, the way that it feels like this thing is going to play out, I think I still go K-State to win the Big 12 right now. I think overall, if everything gets put together, they are the best team, even after everything that we've seen so far in this scenario. They seem like the best team. So I, I think that's where I go because everybody else has flaws. It's just they haven't played the game to expose the flaws yet. And that's what this weekend could be for Iowa state going to Morgantown with, you know, probably a pretty re-energized West Virginia fan base. Like this has to be the the game where if you think Iowa state is going to get booted from this race, the offense goes silent for three and a half quarters or whatever. They only score 17 points against West Virginia. However you want to look at it. The team that I think probably also gets there in the mix for them. I think, I think it's Iowa State because, again, I mentioned the schedule situation here. You look around and you say their best chance for losses is probably the last two weeks of the regular season at Utah and K-State at home. But you get K-State at home, and then the road trip to Utah very well could be obsolete in how we talk about it uh, by the end of the year because the Cam Rising situation is going to play a big role. Uh, and then my show, the team that I think ends up just missing out right now, I don't feel good about it. This is the one that I think will change probably, uh, but I'll put BYU there. I will give them the credit right now for being unbeaten. No, I think it's important to have a coach that it's very clear and obvious your team is going to do anything for, and they're going to listen to everything he says. I think they have that in Kalani Sataki. They have some legitimate playmakers. They might be able to get a little bit healthier in some of their weaker spots. Um, and the schedule. They, their schedule has opened up to be pretty favorable now that they've already gotten past K-State at home. And you look around, Oklahoma State has only gotten easier. Arizona's only gotten easier. KU's only gotten easier. And those fans are absolutely going to think in a couple of weeks, even though they're just like K-State fans in Allen Fieldhouse, they might have a team right now where they think, for some stupid reason, they can go win in Salt Lake City. So I will go BYU in that third spot uh, with my show. Fan, uh, where do you land on your win play show in the Big 12? Uh, it's, a, it's a good game a good thing to look at I, I i tend to agree with a lot of your takes on uh what you said especially your first two i think k-state still is the team to beat and a, a little bit homerish but I, I still think looking at it on paper that we're the best team um, i think we've got the best combo of offense and defense in the league um, iowa state would be my s- second i think they are uh, the team that that should be in position because of the schedule and because of maybe the best or second best defense in the league, and it, it's tough. Utah's tough because of the Cam Rising situation. Um, I will say they do get BYU and Iowa State both at home. So I, but they lost to Arizona at home. So that's where it's tough. I I, I would tend to lean. Utah over BYU because I do think Utah's even without Cam Rising should be the better team um, than BYU um, even with BYU's schedule. So I, I would put Utah in my third spot just because of of the way their schedule lays out. And I do think they're legitimately probably the second best team behind K State in the league if if I just looked at everything on their roster and how they're put together. I'm going to shake things up a little bit. Okay, and I'm still going to have K- I'm still going to have K-State as my number 1 as well. Uh 
going into this week, uh, because I think I kind of think that this could be a little bit of a chaotic week in the Big 12 again. Sounds but, bad for Chris Kleiman. But, but if Utah wins this week, I, I think that I'd put Utah in my second spot. Uh, because, I mean, we all have kind of hit on the Cam Rising situation, but, I mean, have you looked at their schedule? It's, yes. Uh, it's not like their schedule is murderer's row either. Yeah, it's it's uh, like Fan mentioned, they get BYU and Iowa State at home, and then at that point you're like, is the road trip to Arizona State on a Friday night or the road trip to Boulder tougher? Because that's that's what you're talking about is their third toughest game. And, and then uh, for my third team, it, it's a team that I, I don't know if I necessarily like, but the way that their schedule lines up too, yeah, I'm going to say Texas Tech. I mean, their toughest game left is at Iowa State, but they got West Virginia at home. They got Colorado at home. They got Baylor. They play Baylor and TCU. Yeah. And then they go to Stillwater. And who knows what Oklahoma State's going to be like November 23rd when they play? Because, yeah. you know, Oklahoma State could just fold in the season by that point. So, I mean, there's a chance that they could be that second or third team. Uh, but I think that that's what I'd go with. But, I said that I think it's going to be a chaotic week in the Big 12 because I, if I was going to pick some games just right now off cuff, I'd go Arizona State over Utah. Uh, nobody cares about Cincinnati UCF. so I won't Good even, call. Good call. I'm not even going to pick a winner there. Uh, Arizona over BYU and then West Virginia over Iowa State. Okay. I like it. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say this about Utah. That's another one where – I think everybody thinks if Cam Rising comes back, Utah is one or two in the pick of the Big 12. But it's going to come down to, is he going to come back in enough time? Like, mm -hmm. fortunately, the schedule is pretty easy. Once they get past Arizona State, they're going to have uh, a, a three-week stretch against TCU, Houston, and then a bye week before they play BYU. Um, but they should probably be getting dinged a little bit harder for a 22-19 to 19 win in Stillwater. Um, because they let Oklahoma State come back and make that an interesting game. And then you you look at what everybody else has done offensively against Oklahoma State the last two weeks. Um, o, o State's been abused there. K-State went and put up 42. And then this past week, West Virginia put up 38. And there Utah sits with just 22. And they did a lot of that on nothing, 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 big play, nothing, 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 big play. Whereas K-State and West Virginia just beat the crap out of Oklahoma State throwing or running all day long. So it'll be interesting to uh, see how Utah kind of responds and, and what the Cam Rising situation looks like. I would definitely consider them if Rising was healthy, but the offense just is not a threat if he's not uh, in the lineup. So we'll see how it goes, and we'll do this again next week, see how drastically everything has changed. Uh, last thing for everybody, we'll call this our kicker for the day. Uh, I just want to point out that Tim Brando was bad this weekend on the Iowa State game. Uh, I know this is not a, a surprise to anybody. Also probably not surprising that those nerds up there uh, think that Tim Brando is an elite broadcaster. That's an actual tweet <laughs> that one of them sent out. Uh, I Yeah, I got that sent to me Thursday or Friday morning, and I was just like, oh, that that's pretty on brand that they think he's good. Followed up by the fact that uh, last night he was calling Abu Sama Abu Sama uh, was how he was saying his name. I don't know. I, Abu Sama doesn't actually seem like the toughest name to get right. <laughs> Abu Sama just seems like you're intentionally trying to get it wrong. So really what we found out here is if there's a U involved, Tim Brando probably is going to have a tough time figuring it out because uh, <laughs> Felix Anyadike Usama gave him the fits for a while there. Uh, so... Yeah, there you go. That's uh, the kicker for this week. And uh, next week, I'll, I'll have it built up a little bit better where there's a cool graphic for it. It won't have anything to do with the topic, but it will at least be uh, – it'll make you guys laugh in the same vein as uh, the picture of Dan Hawkins right yeah. there. Uh, real quick, I'll give this to you guys to close it out. Favorite Colorado memory before they left the Big 12? It can be a game. It can be a specific thing. It doesn't even have to be only football. Uh, but your favorite Colorado memory – uh, before they left the Big 12? Um, for I me, know was, fans' least favorite Colorado memory. Which one would that be? I, well, I, 
I was I well I, I guess that's not a uh, that's maybe not as clear cut as uh, I I thought I was going to say it was the Pasco fiasco. Well, that but. that was just funny though. I mean, that was just funny. The, my my down my worst moment was ninety five. I don't know if you guys were born yet, but no. ninety five. <laughs> I wasn't going to say no. I was just going to let it breathe there. Normally, I do say no. Nah, I was negative three, but I wasn't going to say it there. I wasn't going to do that to Cause, fans because ninety five was the year K State was behind, came all the way back and took the lead in the last couple minutes of the fourth quarter um, with this epic drive, and then uh, Colorado got the ball back and went down and scored in like three plays, and then K State had a turnover touchdown and ended up losing the game by ten and was on the brink of beating him for the first time. But then I think the first time we beat him um, a couple years later in Manhattan, beat him pretty badly, was was fun. We also tied him in 1993, which was my freshman year at K-State, when ties were still a thing. And it was weird because you felt good because you tied a ranked team, but it was also weird not to win a game and feel good about it. So those will be some of the ones that I remember. Oh, see, mine aren't like specific games. It's more of just like the nostalgia of the FSN intros before K-State played Colorado. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah well, we sh- I should I should find that somewhere. The, the uh, Noxie one is is the best. The Noxie I wonder, best if, I wonder if I could find him to get him to do a little special intro for us oh, this week oh, for one of the KSO oh, shows. That would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I may have to uh, look into that. Uh, here's a here's a question: Would that tie against Colorado? Would that be the last tie in K State football history? I, I believe it was last tie. So I think it was sixteen to sixteen. Okay. All right. Um, I'm doing some uh, quick research on that. I believe that is factual. I, I believe that uh, sixteen sixteen was the last tie in uh, K State history against Colorado. So there you go. Um, yeah, we'll we'll talk a little. We'll get Noxie fired up. Figure something out for it. But in lieu of Noxie, I'll just play us out with the old FSN. Uh, very elite in how it uh, goes down. I think my I'm trying to think of my favorite Colorado memory before they they bail. I don't honestly. This isn't a necessarily a memory. I've always liked Colorado's uniforms. I think they've always been pretty clean looking, um, plain, simple, but nice. So. I, uh, I actually give Colorado props on that. And I like I like the logo. The Buffalo logo looks mm-hmm. really good, too. Pretty so, sharp. Very sharp. Credits Colorado for looking good. Hopefully they look pretty crappy on the field this weekend. <laughs> K-State heading to Boulder. Uh, we will be here tomorrow recapping what went down with Chris Kleiman. It'll probably, probably be Drew and I. So uh, a heavy dose of Drew as we get ready for K-State and Colorado this week. So for KSU fan, Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. Ha, ha, ha.